Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Coping with Coronavirus. We're gonna give everybody just one more minute to get logged on and then we'll get started. So um, we're gonna be paused for just a second. All right, everyone, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I see a lot of familiar names and some new friends joining us. So thank you everyone for um, logging on today. We know that there is a lot going on right now. So we appreciate you joining us for this webinar. Coping with coronavirus, mental health, remote work challenges, and leading through uncertainty. Today's presentation is brought to you by Dr. Andrea Delegati and Raj Kapoor of And Marketing. I am Amanda Cook, and I am a marketing director for Ann Marketing, and I will be your host today. A little housekeeping before we get started. All participants are muted so that you can hear the presentation clearly today. You are listening by default through your computer speakers, but if you want to join by phone, just hit the phone call button and your call information will come up for you. Uh, you will have an opportunity to ask questions at any time throughout the day. Um, we will address them during the presentation. And if we don't get to them for some reason or another, we will uh, have a Q&A session at the end as well. So I'd like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Andrea Delegati. She is a licensed psychologist and a mental health expert. She has decades of experience uh, helping clients manage stress, implement change, reduce conflict, to maximize their potential. She will be joined today by Raj Kapoor, founder and managing director of AND Marketing. He has a decade of, of experience leading remote teams and AND Marketing is actually um, always has been remote and a distributed team. Um, so hopefully through um, all of this experience and knowledge today, uh, we'll be able to answer some questions for you about leading through this uncertainty, working from home, being productive, and especially caring for yourself and your team's mental health during this time. So with that, let's get started. Um, I'm gonna pose a question to Dr. Delegati first. Um, getting right to the point, what are some mental health effects and ways to combat them while faced with this pandemic and being isolated with social distancing? Thanks so much, Amanda. It's, you know, most of what we're seeing at this point in time are anxiety related symptoms. Um, and so that can be expressed in a number of different ways. But for most people, it's worry or it's fear. Um, there's a sense of loss of control. Some people have what we call obsessive thinking, meaning the same thought keeps going around in circles in their head. And some folks also kind of increased compulsive behavior. And this is behavior that seems to be outside of their control and um, they do more of it. You know, they have the extra glass of wine in the evenings now uh, with this going on. The longer the stress continues, I would expect that we will start to see more of more depressive symptoms, more like sadness and loneliness. Um, negative thinking will increase. Um, people will be more irritable and more angry with each other. And um, I think the other piece that people may already start to be experiencing is uh, a sleep disorder. Maybe they're so keyed up that they're not able to fall asleep at night. Maybe they just feel like staying in bed and they're sleeping too much. Um, there might be an appetite disturbance where we're eating more than we should, or maybe we're the kind of people who get anxious and then we don't eat at all. Um, folks also who have various chronic pain syndromes, there will probably be an increase in the perception of pain that they're experiencing. So those are the general things that we would be expecting uh, to hear from people that they're experiencing, and indeed we are. 
And I think the most important piece in terms of combating is number one, be aware that these are symptoms of stress. It doesn't mean you're going crazy. It just means you're under stress <laughs> and mm -hmm. we need to understand. So if we're irritable and we're more angry with our spouse who happens to be in the same space with <laughs> us currently, it's probably related to the stress that we're under and it doesn't necessarily mean that our marriage is gonna end tomorrow. Um, so number one, we need to be aware that these symptoms are stress related. We have to also be able to articulate these emotional stresses. We need to say it out loud, like, hon, I need a little space. Give me a little elbow room, uh, can you? Um, when you need, when you start to say what your stress is, I would say, use the people around you who are most helpful to you during times of stress. That may be the uh, partner in the next room, but that may also be friends that you're contacting by phone or by, you know, in some distant way that you're accessing them. It's also okay to say that we need to take a break from the stress. We need to take a break even from the symptoms that we're feeling. And we can do that consciously by refocusing our attention on something else. We can do something to distract ourselves from it. Um, there are lots going on around us. And I think the bigger challenge for all of us is this is, we're kind of in crisis mode the last couple of weeks, and we really don't know how long this is going to last. So what I'm telling people is instead of thinking, oh, if I just do this today, tomorrow, it's going to be gone. Maybe we need to think about establishing a new normal for right now. And we need to adjust some of our expectations about how we're structuring our time during the day. Um, I'm going to say at this point, if anyone has such um, symptoms that they are debilitating or they have thoughts of self-harm, they need to seek professional help and they need to reach out to somebody um, immediately and not wait for this to go away. Because for the foreseeable future, this is our new normal. Mm -hmm. That brings up a really um, good point. People with a history of mental health are probably struggling as well, but even those who don't have a history of mental health are probably uh, should be aware of it as well during this time. Oh my goodness. Yeah, we're all under an extreme amount of stress and information overload. And this stress leads to anxiety and anxiety wears us out physically. It taxes our immune system and it leads to overreactions. Um, I saw something actually, I think it was a headline in the Washington Post last week. And I, th the title was something like the thin line between prudence and panic. And I just love that line because that's what I feel like is going on. We have some prudent guidelines and then we have some panic. Mm -hmm. So if I could just take a moment, maybe we could all just be logical and rational just for a moment. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, we've never been there before, at least in our lifetime, right? Um, so let's consider some prudent actions. What would we do in regular cold and flu season? Um, a prudent action, we would try to stay healthy. And by staying healthy, yup, we'd probably wash our hands more. Uh, yes, we'd probably stay away from people who are sick. Um, that makes all sense, right? But, but how about this? we would want to make sure that we are strong enough in our immune system that we're gonna be able to fight off illness. And so what does that mean? We need to keep our immune system working. So let's just do the basics. Proper rest, proper nutrition, physical exercise. Yes, we can go for a walk. We can use our cans of soup in the pantry to do free weights with. Um, we also need socialization. We are social beings. We need human contact and a sense of belonging. And yes, we can do that with the people who reside with us, but we have all the technology available to us to reach out to friends, to, we can check in on our parents, on our adult kids, our grandkids. We can uh, talk to our friends and our coworkers. We just need a phone, right? We don't even need video. We just need a phone. And we often overlook those little creatures that reside with us called our pets who love to have more of our attention and would love to go for walks with us. These are the kinds of things that help to keep us healthy and ready to fight off any illness because we're taking care of ourselves. Yeah, that's really good advice. Um, most of us are having to adapt our daily life in very extreme ways and very quickly. You know, it could be working from home or 
helping kids with schoolwork uh, to maintain their daily schedules, um, being isolated from friends and family, I know is really difficult for extroverts like myself. Um, so what are some steps that we can take to make um, this extreme and sudden shift feel a little bit more manageable? All right, two words for you, structure and consistency. They're the two words I want everybody to walk away from today with. And that is we are creatures of habit. And mo for most of us, our daily structure is imposed on us by our work or by school or by our kids' activities. Um, that all of a sudden got upended last in the last couple of weeks. And now we're being required to structure our own time and to meet the demands of work, to meet the demands of family, and to try to figure out how do we get some personal time in, in here as well. So we're trying to learn how to structure our own day, establish new routines, and all within the context of everybody else being together in the same place, in the same house. Um, and by the way, I just want to do a little shout out to the stay at home moms, dads, grandparents out there who all of a sudden, they don't even have their space to themselves anymore. They have people in them all day long. Um, that's a, that's a stress for them. So we're talking about stress from working from home, but these poor people, they are having people imposed upon them. Um, so let's think about it. I think the first thing is within your physical structure where you're living, working, we need to have physical space designated for everybody. I'm in my office. My husband is in the next room. That's his office. I think the kids need to have a space to, to do some work, maybe some homework or schoolwork of some sort, but they also need to have a place to spend, to play. Um, so once we have that all figured out in our where we're living and where we reside, how everybody's split up um, and have their own space, then we have to make some boundaries around the demands that are being placed in our time. We need boundaries around our work. We need it around our family time time with our friends and we also have to have some designated time for self-care that's really important for us so structure there you go physical structure the emotional structure around our roles and the next part is consistency establish a daily routine and stick with it we are creatures of habit routines make us feel psychologically safe for all of us so please make a routine and stick with it. It doesn't mean you do the same thing every day. It means that you just put an activity into that spot that same time every day. Great, so we do have a question from the audience that um, is talking about that daily routine. However, um, so this individual says their father who is 75 refuses to stop taking his daily trip to the donut shop, grocery store, and even the bank. Any suggestions about how they can convince him to stay put? So it, for some of us, we have our shelter in place, so we don't even get to do that and everything's closed out there. But I wonder whether or not some of those places can deliver. I wonder if someone can go for a walk with him to that location, but maybe he doesn't go in right or maybe we change the walk to the walk on the trail or a walk around the block where we're not actually we're able to keep some of that social distancing in i think when we're talking we're trying to keep people in their homes and i'm hearing this a lot um, for uh, millennials and whatnot who have elderly parents they have this great fear that they're going to step out the door and all of a sudden get the virus the idea is they can still step out the door <laughs> they just can't be around in close proximity to other people. I guess I'm saying I wouldn't take away his walk. I would have his walk to happen in maybe a different way. Great. Um, so between the TV, internet, and social media, we're constantly being inundated with news, data, facts, and fiction. Uh, what is the healthiest way to stay informed without becoming overwhelmed? I'm advising people to just pick a couple couple reputable news sources for information and go to them, stick with them. So for example, um, the CDC is giving us the guidance um, nationwide. If you have um, 
relatives more globally. The World Health Organization is also putting out information. Um, I think for some things more local in our states, state health departments are there. Um, some of us even have county health departments. All of those places we can go and get information from. I also, in terms of, um, oh, for, I have to say about social media, beware of social media. People can post whatever they want on social media. I usually tell clients, if you're really needing and have a need to go search the internet for something, um, if you stick with sites that end with .org or .edu, at least you're getting some vetted information uh, that's probably more accurate than what you're going to find in, on social media. Um, so, so that's the one piece. The other piece is you need to turn off the constant news stream. This is crazy making to have 24-7 news. It's not changing, that, or maybe I should say it this way. Did you notice how the news kept changing with each hour that we were watching it in the last couple of weeks? Do we really need to know all those little details as it shifts from one thing to another back again? I think it's fine to check on the news. And perhaps you do that first thing in the morning, and perhaps you do that early in the afternoon. That's kind of what we would do in the old days um, when we just had TVs and radios that we were listening to before going to and from work. Um, that's what we did. I, I'm going to caution people, please turn off the constant news streams. And if you're going to check the news at night, please don't do it before you go to bed. Do we really need nightmares before we step go into bed? We, it's just so much better to check it in the early um, evening, and then if you want to chat with somebody about it, there you go. You can process it and have a little time to do that. Great advice. Um, before we shift focus to um, working from home with Raj, I want to ask one more question that came in that, uh, Dr. Delegati, you are probably equipped to answer. Um, I have a family member who's a recovering alcoholic and struggling with having his daily routine disrupted. Any advice for him or how I can help him? Definitely what I just went over in terms of reestablishing a new routine. Because again, when you're in a recovering mode, right, everything is very important. And I would be wondering also about support groups. I'm noticing that some things are going virtual. I don't know if that's the case with AA and NA and whatnot. Um, I know it is happening with uh, some of the uh, weight loss programs and things like that. So the same kind of things when we'd be reaching out to support groups, I think we need to have them put in. But I also think the daily routine is really important. And I don't know specifically what they're, what they're talking about there, um, but we do need to have the structure. We do need to have something established in this new normal um, and what we're facing. Great, thank you. Um, as I said, I'm gonna focus um, on some work from home uh, content now. So for those of us that are navigating a newly assigned work from home setup, what are some tips on adjusting to a new work environment, Raj? Yeah, great, uh, great question, uh, Amanda. Good afternoon. So, you know, I, I think there's a couple really high level uh, tips that I would have, uh, you know, uh, as you said in the intro, I've been working from home uh, for about 10 years and I've done various jobs, some that travel a lot, some that don't travel. Um, and really, uh, th there's a couple things that I would probably start with. There's a lot I could go on about. Uh, but number one is uh, all to do with physical space. So um, once you've broken the barrier between your work and your personal life, you need to really think about what that is in your in your home environment. So personally, because I knew I was going to go be, be working from home, I have an office in my basement that's cordoned off. I have three kids. Uh, most of the people who are on this uh, webinar may know that, but it's you know it's a floor away from everybody else. Sometimes I hear some stomping above my head, but it's usually kept at bay. So what I do is I physically create a different space. Now, if you're doing this for the first time and you don't have that, you need to find the best way to do that for yourself. Um, there's really two reasons why a physical space is important, at least as I see it. Um, the first is to obviously avoid distraction, right? So if you're working and you have a really blurred line between your professional life and your personal life, and there's the kids and the laundry and the kitchen and the this and the that, um, it's very hard to actually focus and get work done. Um, so creating a physical space where you are working uh, allows you to focus on your work, and then when you're home, you're allowed to be you're allowed to be at home. 
Um, the second reason is a little bit, maybe a little bit tougher to get your mind around, but it actually creating that physical barrier prevents you from working too much. And mentally, if you end up not having a physical barrier between your home space and your workspace, uh, you end up missing the two. Most people think that they're gonna not work enough. What ends up happening is that they end up working too much. They end up working too late at the, into the night with those screens in their faces way too late. It ends up affecting their sleep, affecting their health. And I've seen that happen to tons of very well-meaning people. So creating a physical barrier, preferably with a door, a door you can shut or things you can put away that signals, okay, I am done with work. So number one, I would say is creating a physical space that is distinct. Uh, don't make it in the kitchen. Don't make it in a common place. If you can do that uh, at, at any sort of, uh, at any way. Um, I think the second thing is um, change your routine. Don't just think it's business as usual. So as Andrew was saying, create a new normal and a new structure. And what I mean by not saying that it's business as usual, you've got to rethink how are you going to interact with your coworkers, right? There's no more water cooler random interactions. Um, you have to be more proactive. One of the things we do, uh, Amanda, as you know, it in marketing is we do a bunch of one-on-ones. So almost every week, each of us meets with each other in a structured session for 15 or 30 minutes just to catch up. And we catch up as people, personal stuff, but we also catch up on work topics. And that's how we interact and sort of simulate the, wa the water cooler. But you really have to be proactive about how you manage your day and your schedule because work will tend not to come to you and you will fall behind because obviously in the working world, you need to keep things going. Um, I love uh, uh, Andrea's points, and I had this as one of my points as well, is avoid distractions. The devil is this phone, right? We all have this phone and it buzzes and it beeps, and pops an email, and it gives you the latest notification on the news and the weather and whatever's happening in, you know, in, in the White House, whatever's happening with CDC. You, don't, you need to turn all of those distractions off. Um, at End Marketing, we talk a lot about the importance of deep work. So blocking your calendar off to actually do work and turn all of your emails off, all of your Slack messages off, so you can focus on your task at hand with your entire brain without having to constantly check messages. You have to restructure the way you go through it. Um, so I really encourage the second piece is to check in with teammates and things like that. Awesome. Um, I know at Anna Marketing, we've, we've got a lot of tools that we use to communicate and work remotely. What are the most valuable tools teams can use as they work remote as their new normal? Uh, so from a tools perspective, I think there's probably a couple that I that I really recommend. So the first is the use of video. Um, when we started the company, we used to do almost everything over audio conference call. And I would say the quality of our interactions uh, was 10 times more effective when we switched over to video. So tools like Zoom, Google Hangouts, um, or Skype or whatever the programs that your team, uh, Microsoft Teams has a really good product. Um, our, our team in particular uses Uber Conference and Zoom very successfully. Um, and whenever you can do your interactions over, um, over some sort of a video or facial interaction, it just increases the quality of our, of our conversations. So whether that's a team event or whether that's individual one-on-ones, I cannot uh, advocate anymore for video. Um, the second one is Slack. So Slack um, is an extremely popular tool. Um, us as a team, we have almost entirely eliminated internal email. So everybody talks about how much they dislike email. What ends up happening is Slack. It's a pretty much, it's a free tool uh, that you can use. There's certainly a paid version, but we've been using it for three years with the free version. And uh, what it basically does is act as an instant messenger and an internal communications tool. And if you develop a really good rhythm, it disaggregates the timeliness of things. So you don't have to go and check every single Slack message every single second. And so create communication protocols within your company where you understand where people are going to communicate. Um, so I think those are the, the, the probably the two best tools I can recommend or, or some sort of a instant messenger tool. I think Slack is the best one. And then from a video perspective, I think Zoom is pretty good. Yeah, I can attest, you know, using Slack and reducing the amount of emails I get in general has been life changing. <laughs> well, good. Um, yeah. So what types of remote activities can leaders set up or facilitate for their teams in order to connect on a regular basis? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. So besides the one-on-ones, I think, again, think back to yourself. It's not business as usual. So if you're leading a team in particular, find ways for people to get uh, interactions either formally or informally. 
One of the things that we do as a team, Amanda, obviously you know this, but one of the things uh, we're huge advocates for are virtual happy hours. And, and they're just that. So, so we're not all in the same physical space. We're not all in the same cities. But if we actually schedule time to sit around the water cooler, we actually invite people to bring alcoholic or non-alcoholic beverages of their choice, and we literally catch up on things. Um, you know, one of the things Amanda brought to our team a few months ago is the concept of a rose bud thorn. So once a month, we all get together and we each talk about a rose in our life, a bud in our life and a thorn. So a rose is something that's going well. Usually it's not work related at all. A bud is something that you're looking forward to. And a thorn is something that may be happening that's not so great. And so literally our team of about 15 people, we go around and we share that. And I would say more than 75% of those items are personal. And because we don't work in the same physical space, we don't realize that. And it gets us to know our teammates a little bit better. It allows us to share some laughs, allows us to understand us a little bit more as people. So I think the concept of a virtual happy hour is really good. Um, the second thing that we do uh, pretty routinely is a Monday morning meeting. So every Monday morning at nine o'clock, we get together as a full team and we do a quick rundown of what's going on in the week. What are our priorities? What's happening with our clients? What's happening with our teams? We do some team shout outs. And again, if you were physically all together, you might get together, you may not, but this forces everybody to sort of get their week started on the same note. So as many of those interactions that you guys can, that you can create with your teams, uh, formally or informally, uh, will only help sort of ease the transition to a remote working life. Great. Um, Faraj, how can leaders be transparent about what's going on in their business during this time? Um, and what's the best way to deliver those message? And, and Andrea, you might be able to answer, you know, what's the best way to deliver that type of message to somebody? But Raj, um, how do you be transparent? Yeah, it's, it's, so it's, it's a great question. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, I, I, I saw this sort of quote and it, it really struck me. It, it, adversity doesn't build character, it reveals it. And I think when you look at really good leaders and how they communicate, during times of trouble, you really see leadership sort of uh, 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 separate itself from the from the rest of the pack. So, you know, my advice in that it's it's hard to give advice because there's so many good leaders that I know have registered for this as well. But to be transparent, you just have to be a little vulnerable and be honest and use words like I don't know how this is going to go. I don't know how long the coronavirus is going to affect our business. And I think if you're just extremely honest with your team. Um, empathetic to their situations because obviously it's your paycheck, it's their paycheck. There's times of uncertainty. You may have a business downturn. Um, I think relaying as much optimism and confidence as possible is probably really important. Um, so what we did in our team was all this coronavirus stuff was happening like a week and a half ago. Schools were starting to get shut down. It was going to disrupt people's personal lives. I started getting a bunch of questions. So on that Monday morning meeting, I just sent a message to everybody. I said, guys, we're going to have a, a longer than normal Monday morning meeting. I want all of your questions. What are you worried about? What are you thinking about? What are you thinking about our clients? What's going on in your home lives? And let's just have an open discussion with it. And, and gosh, I think I probably said, I don't know the answer to that maybe more than half the times, but I'm going to go find out. Let's go find this thing out together. You know, so one of the things we did was we decided to call all of our clients. What's going on in your world? Let's understand what's happening. And some of those were difficult conversations because their businesses were affected by it. And a company like ours has to you know, change our work environment for it. So I think the answer to transparency is just be as transparent and honest as, as possible. And I think your team will appreciate that. At least that's the comments that I got. There's a really good example, Amanda, that I do have to share. Um, the CEO of Marriott, his name's Arne Sorensen, he sent a video message to his half a million associates in Marriott. And I think it was a masterclass in crisis communications. As you guys can imagine, the hotel business was devastated by the coronavirus, right? In some examples, he said his occupancy rates went from 100% down to less than 5%. And he sent about a five minute video message that I think everybody on this webinar should go watch because he's authentic, he's transparent, he's honest, um, he had immediate corrective actions that he went through. He was going to take no salary for the rest of the year. They were going to cut their expenditures. His executive team was going to reduce their pay. And he sort of just, just said it so well. It didn't seem rehearsed, even though it probably was. And it just came straight from his heart, and it was, it was full of emotion. So there's some really good examples out there of how leaders can be communicating with their teams. Andrew, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think there are, I mean, I do think leaders have huge responsibility uh, to their teams, not only to keep them informed, but to motivate them. And, you know, if you ever do a, a lit review, a literature review on what's leadership, you know, you come down with all of these guidelines. 
Um, but the one thing that people settle on in terms of defining leadership is, you know, it's hard to define, but we know it when we see it. And we also know when we don't see it. So some thoughts about that. Um, leaders don't blame other people. They create a sense that we're all in this together and we're working on a solution. Um, as Raj said, they, they gather information um, and they make the best decision they can at that time with that information. And leaders recognize that information can change and we might need to change the decision. And that's being genuine and authentic um, with your employees to say, um, I don't know, this is what we're calling it for right now. And if something changes, we will reassess and do something else. Um, leaders collaborate with other people. They communicate clearly and often. I love your example, Raj, of that CEO. Um, but leaders also manage the message. They do not do things that cause fear and anxiety in other people. They don't add to it. So if you happen to be a leader and you know yourself to be a glass half empty kind of guy or gal, keep that to yourself and try to be a little more positive when you're talking to other people. Um, I think that the other piece of this that I always enjoy is that we don't realize, but that what we say to people, what we're communicating and the words that we use constitute only about 3% of what people take away from their interaction with us. So nonverbal communication is huge. And what does that mean? Your tone of voice, your demeanor, your rate of speech, you know? Um, what's your body language telling folks? We are giving off all kinds of cues that people are picking up on all the time. And especially if we are using video conferencing and whatnot, we need to be aware of what we are saying to other people more than just what our words are saying. We want to know what our tone of voice is saying, what is our body communicating to others? Thanks, Dr. Delegati. Um, this one is for Raj, and I can, I think Raj does a really great job at this in our organization. So um, what are the best ways for leaders to effectively provide support or regular check-ins with teams remotely, especially, this is important at all times, in remote teams, but this is critically important at times like this. Yeah, so what was the question, Amanda? How, how can we best check in with employees? Is that is that the question? Regular check-ins, provide yeah. support. Yeah, so so I think this is a great, uh, you know, get, getting to become friends or at least friendly with your team is super important because, uh, you know, obviously when you're hiring somebody, you don't ask the questions about what their personal life is like and those things you're not supposed to. And I'm certainly not advocating for that. But once you're working together, to get beyond the just work sort of stuff is really important because when you reach crisis times or, or challenging times like what we're facing, that's when you're going to need the information. And so uh, communicating more is at a minimum. Communicating one on one is super important. So one of the things, again, I said I said we do uh, already is I do a one on one with almost everybody in our little company at least every week or two. And so during this time, what I added to that is uh, a note of flexibility and just asking what's going on. Um, so again, I think we you know we have a, a, a couple dozen people on our team, but 15 is kind of our core team. And there are 15 different life situations that are happening and we can't just assume everybody's going through the same thing. Uh, we've got a ton of working parents. So all of a sudden they have become a teacher overnight and, and somebody who's not wanting to be a teacher or qualified to be a teacher has to go teach their kids. My, my wife is upstairs right now with our three kids trying to be a teacher and she's not qualified to do it. So there's certainly a lot more yelling than I normally would anticipate in their regular life. And so you have to remember that's part of their life, right? So, so uh, you know, Amanda, you've got a couple kids and, and juggling their work schedule, their school schedules with your demanding work schedule has to take some understanding and flexibility. Uh, we have one woman on our team um, who has a stepdaughter and her stepdaughter's uh, stepsister, so the other couple's daughter, uh, for a few days had no um, childcare besides the person with whom we work. And so she had to take the responsibility of two kids while she has a full-time job. And oh, by the way, she's really busy all the time anyway because of her job. So offering her flexibility, offering her backup, uh, you know, offering her, hey, you know, the, the time that you get the work done doesn't matter if you need to hand off a project or something like that. Making that conversation uh, not an exception, but a completely routine part of, way, of the way we work. Um, one of the questions I used to ask that I don't really ask anymore is, how happy are you 
What's going on in your world today? Because if I only talk to you for 30 minutes in a 40 hour work week or whatever, I, I really don't have a chance to see what's happening. You know, maybe the weather's bad where you are. Maybe you had a bad day. Maybe you got a flat tire. Maybe your kid's homesick from school. So getting beyond the superficial check-ins and really getting into knowing the person uh, in times like this, that allows you to just, you know, personalize your um, ability to help them, ability to help them succeed and things like that. So, I, you know, I just think it's, it's such a, it's such a, it's such a cliche to treat everybody the same way that you really have to customize your relationship to each person. And, and what I like to say is, you know, acting like you care is important, but actually caring about the person is even more important. So if you care about the people, it becomes incredibly easy. So true. Um, Raj, so much of the news is negative and rightfully so, given the amount of in industries that are being impacted. Uh, how can businesses and employees remain positive during this time? And for those that aren't being impacted or affected, how can they show support to the business community? Yeah, I think uh, first things first, I mean, from a business perspective, uh, this is a really good opportunity to shine. There's, you know, some really good examples in the last recession. Uh, companies like Airbnb, uh, Slack, I think I mentioned earlier, Venmo. These are companies that uh, sprung up in the last recession. So whatever we're calling this dip, this recession, whatever we're going through right now because of coronavirus is going to spur in a bunch of innovation. We just don't know what that looks like right now. And so um, I think the first thing people need to do is empathetically reach out to their clients and prospects, understand what they're going through and offer them help. Now, the balance that you have to strike is you can't be exploitative, right? That is the worst thing you could do at this time is say, hey, I'm open for business. I want your business come by for me. That will get you rejected very, very, very quickly. So strike a balance between being empathetic and helpful and being exploitative. I think that's probably advice number one. I think number two, is start to look at the future of your industry or your customer's industries and start to think to yourself, okay, what are the products and services that I offer today or that I should be offering to all of these different people that may help them right now? And how can I use that to map my future, all right? This is a great, Microsoft was created during a, during a recession. There's so many of these great examples that really look at a, a, a recession as an opportunity to go change something about their business. Now that's not true for everybody, certainly, um, but it could be the way that you know, business leaders or people in the business world start thinking about what are the trends that this is uncovering, certainly in healthcare, certainly in travel, certainly in leisure, certainly in technology. We can see these examples. So start to think about yourself that way or your business that way. Those might be some tips you think about. Great. Thanks. We actually have a question um, from our participants, and this is either Raj or Dr. Delagani. Any suggestions for students in the new norm? They are adjusting to taking classes online, plus being very disconnected from their social norms, especially college kids. Wow, I like that idea again of trying to put structure in and what's the hallmark of college is having that lack of structure and freedom from home to interact with their peers. So again, we have to, I think, marshal the technology um, and you guys can still have your happy hours. Raj just tells you to do it virtually. So how about it? <laughs> you know, um, I think the other piece is to recognize, again, recognize the stress in all of that. I know some kids were sent home from college and they weren't even, it wasn't, some of the colleges ended up providing plane tickets for folks to go home. I mean, the way some of this has been done has been su such a, a shock and almost a bit of a trauma to be pulled out so quickly. And we do have those students locally around here who were pulled out of Italy um, and brought home immediately. So all of this is can be very traumatic. And I'm, what I'm gonna say is you need to take care of yourself. You need to be able to continue to socialize, just figuring out a new way to do that. Um, I'm sure you probably could have study groups and those kind of things that are happening virtually um, around the actual core material that you're doing. I think it's harder to get your head around the question of, wow, am I going to even be able to graduate with my class and walk down um, and get my diploma? I mean, I had a student, a client who's just finishing a master's in leadership, and that's what she said. She went back as an adult to get this uh, degree, and now she's like, I don't even know if I'll get to graduate and actually feel that success. Um, 
I know I've done all the work. I know it's all, you know, getting done, but I'm missing out that piece of human experience. So we're doing the best we can with that. Raj, do you have thoughts? No, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really hard one, especially the people that are important at life, uh, at very important inflection points in life, such as a graduation or some sort of date like that. This is pretty traumatic. I mean, my kids are relatively young. They're not at those points. But I think really acknowledging that it's going to be hard and different and coming up with alternative ways to uh, make those celebrations happen, even if it's a year late or something like that, to give yourself something to look forward to or to give yourself something uh, mentally that that you know that allows people like your client Andrea um, to potentially have something to look forward to it, again the, the most important thing we can't do as a society is completely ignore the mental aspect of that because it's really hard and we can continue pretending life's the same but it's not so acknowledging it putting together plans for our own individual selves you know I don't have a perfect answer for the students out there um, but I think really uh, helping them through that asking them to maybe talk it through uh, the use of technology is a great idea. I don't advocate too much happy hours for the wrong age group, certainly, but um, you know, th those are the types of things that happen. You know, we've got uh, uh, so many people have been posting on social media what they're doing for their birthdays. So doing a virtual birthday party can make people feel better. Uh, you know, doing those types of things. Do the very best you can to get through the time, and then once we realize how long this is going to take us as a society, we can start coming up with okay, now what? Is it a for example, is it a half birthday that we start to celebrate six months from now when this is passed? And we look back at this and we laugh about what happened, you know, those types of things. Thanks, Raj. Um, you know, mental health and adjusting to this new normal is such an important topic. So if we haven't answered everyone's questions yet, please make sure to get those into the questions box um, and we will ask those at the end. In the meantime, uh, Dr. Delegati, you shared some really uh, good insights today and helpful information for people to deal with their mental health during this time. Do you have any parting thoughts you'd like to leave with us? Sure. Thank you, Amanda. You know what? People are remarkably resilient and we tend to forget that. Um, set adversity in front of us and we, we Americans are pretty good at coming up with creative solutions as Raj mentioned, in terms of the last downturns, you know, in the in the markets and, you know, recessions or whatever we call these things. Um, I think that we haven't had as much opportunity to, to think, wow, we are resilient. Let's think creatively. How are we going to manage day to day? What are we going to do? Um, how are we going to take care of ourselves and the people we love? And how are we going to, or, or are we going to give ourselves permission to ask for help when we need it? And I guess that's the last thing that I really want to say. If stress seems overwhelming, please know that mental health providers are considered essential medical personnel. So almost all mental health providers have their offices opening. Open, we are not seeing people many times um, in person. We're doing it virtually, by phone. Um, but people are there to help. So if it feels overwhelming, whether that's today, tomorrow, or next week, or however long this goes on, please seek out help um, and the resources that you have in your local community, because there's nothing that compares to having that ear um, of someone who can assess the symptoms if you're concerned that your symptoms are more extreme than what you think they should be, so that you can get the help that you need. Um, nobody needs to suffer in silence. There are there is help that's just a phone call away for everyone. Great, thank you. We did have one more question come in, and, and both of you might have some um, an answer to this. Any tips for talking about coronavirus with 10 or 11 year olds, and how honest but not scary? Right. Um, interesting, right? For children. So the first thing for a parent that you need to do is keep your own stress in check because your children are masters at picking up on what your emotional experience is. Um, I think you need to keep the information age appropriate for a 10 year old. A 10 year old can process information a little differently than a five year old and certainly will do it less well than a 15 year old. So it has to be age appropriate keep those routines and schedules in place, limit media exposure, um, make sure you have that family time. 
movies, board games, card games, bike rides. Sometimes kids will not talk to you directly about what they're feeling and what they're thinking. But if you engage them in a game, they it just can come out and you can use that game over which to communicate some very important information to them. Um, uh, you know, little, even just things, arts and crafts, jigsaw puzzles. I mean, just think about that. You're all sitting around together, working on a project together. And then the child just says, well, mom, what does this mean? I heard this on the TV. Um, and please, yes, probably the biggest thing I can say is turn off the TV so that <laughs> they don't hear it from there and get upset about it. Um, and you can uh, filter that information that's age appropriate. And I wish I could say, you know, I could say every 10 year old will respond in this way, but it's not. Every 10 year old has a different personality, a different capacity to process certain types of information. Sometimes it's verbal, sometimes it's more visual. Um, that's something that you have to assess with regard to your child. Yeah, it's funny you gave that example, and, and I'm certainly not a qualified you know, psychologist like Andrea is, but it's funny you gave that example because I have an 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 5-year-old, and they absolutely process information differently. They ask different types of questions. Um, so there's a, couple, there's a couple of things I did as a parent. So there's a couple of kids. So I'm a podcast. Uh, I love podcasts. I listen to probably way too many hours a week of podcasts, and I found a couple of them to be really good, specifically devoted to children. And a couple of them have done a great job in just the last couple of weeks about putting out episodes about the coronavirus. And they do completely what you said, Andrea, is they do age appropriate commentary about truths and myths about coronavirus. They went through this silly example where a kid at school basically said, if you have the wrong kind of grape, you can't eat it, otherwise you're gonna get coronavirus. So really myth busting about the obvious things. And we had a good conversation and, and the, 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 you know, the, sh the, the silver lining out of this whole thing is I went through it with my kids and we said, you're extremely unlikely to get sick. That's a fact. Um, we're keeping you away from people so that you're not a transmitter of this. Learn how to wash your hands because my kids are notoriously terrible at washing their hands. It's really important that you do it. It's really important that you take care of yourself. It's really important that you take this time to sort of redo your own schedule. And we actually develop separate schedules for each of the three kids based on their own learning styles and their own personalities, right? So the example that I'll just, I'll, I'll use to bring uh, Andrea's advice to life is my oldest son is 11. He never asks questions in a one-on-one -on -one environment unless we're playing sports. So we're either throwing a football around or playing basketball together. And all of a sudden he opens up, he asks questions. Hey, what's going on with this? Tell me about the coronavirus. Why is this happening in China? What's going on with us? And we have very honest discussions about it. And that's just the way we communicate. So for the other parents out there that might be facing that, it's just just remember that it's not easy and it's very dependent. And you know, I'm the last person that should be giving parental advice, but I do know that all kids are different when it comes to this kind of thing. And you have to, you know, you have to treat each of them separately. Great. Thanks, Raj. I want to be mindful of our time today. So um, please, if you have any questions about mental health, uh, please reach out to Dr. Delegati. Um, if you have any questions for Raj about working from home, please feel free to contact him at his email address. Um, you should be receiving a recording of this. I encourage you to share it as a resource to other people who you think might need it. Um, we'd really appreciate it if you could provide us with some feedback on today's webinar via the um, evaluation that you'll get immediately following this. We are going to present this information to some other groups. So any way that you can help us improve it for those groups would be uh, greatly appreciated. Um, thank you again for everyone joining us today. Uh, we look forward to connecting with you again soon. And um, this concludes today's webinar. Please uh, stay healthy and stay safe. Thanks everyone.